So wow, 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 Hank Green himself of the Green Brothers has cancer. That's a hell of a thing. That's a hell of a thing to get through your head. To know that Hank Green is definitely gonna die. That's horrible. We don't know. We don't know if it's gonna be two weeks or if it's gonna be 80 years. But Hank Green's definitely gonna die. <laughs> That's what we call, that's what we call cancer humor right there. That's what we call cancer humor. Oh my God, is he gonna die? Yes, yes, we know for a fact Hank Green is gonna die. Oh my God, when? Could, could be tomorrow, could be tomorrow. Or, you know, it could be 80 years from now. Still gonna die, still gonna die. Nobody gets out of life alive. I was talking to the doctor, so uh, so my wife's had three cancers. My wife's had three cancers, and we lived in Maryland. We had the same doctor. So my doctor asked me, the doctor, because it was like during COVID or whatever, when I got my, uh, oh my, um, my, I <laughs> got my uh, my yearly checkup with him, and you know he was asking, you know how how my wife was doing, and I was like, well, she seems to be doing fine. As far as far as we know, she seems to be doing good. And my doctor looked at me and was like, you know, Eli, that's a coping mechanism. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, doc. <laughs> you know, with, with an intuition like that, you should be a doctor. But yeah, kind of weird. It's kind of weird when you, uh, when you look at life through the lens of cancer and dealing with cancer significantly. Everything just is, just is a little bit different, right? The humor. The humor is just different. It's like this guy that I knew, this guy. So, so, so Hank Green. Hank Green has Hodgkin's lymphoma that is, uh, that is very treatable, very treatable. Like the flu. It's like the flu of cancers, right? I knew this guy, though. I knew this guy. You know, he got, he got Hodgkin's lymphoma, a lot like, a lot like Hank Green, right? Got in there. The doctor said, don't worry, your prognosis looks very good. We're going to get you in for chemo, the whole nine yards. And uh, and he was a happy boy, right? Because he's like, okay, well, I got cancer, but it's not going to be that bad. But I got to tell you, man, I got to tell you, he didn't live through the week. He was dead before his first appointment. Yeah. That bus just pancaked his ass. <laughs> what? Wait, what? <laughs> Uh, cancer humor, <laughs> cancer humor. <laughs> Just when you thought Eli the computer guy was dark before, <laughs> now we get into cancer humor. That was a joke. But it is interesting with Hodgkin's lymphoma, because you never know, you never know with the cancers. Because um, I was like with my wife, my wife had, uh, had melanoma, she had skin cancer. So she had uh, thyroid cancer, she had breast cancer, and she had uh, skin cancer. And it was, it was interesting because uh, we were at this uh, Christmas, so this isn't a joke, this is, it should be a joke, it's not a joke. Anyways, we're at this Christmas party, and she's sitting there, and she just got the, the the skin cancer dealt with, and she was talking to somebody, and it was like it's it was no big deal, right? She had already done thyroid cancer, she had already done breast cancer, a double mastectomy, skin cancer. She was like, yeah, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get cancer, yeah, no big deal. Oh my God, this literally, this literally, the woman that she was talking to was like, my father died of that skin cancer. <laughs> so. Never mind, never mind. Take all cancers seriously. I was talking with a buddy of mine uh, yesterday, actually. Um, he had he had Hodgkin's. He had Hodgkin's cancer, and uh, uh, got cured. Cured. Uh, went through uh, went through one round. <clears throat> went through one round of chemo, and now he's long. He's long outside of it. It's like five years, something like five years, um, for remission or whatever. And he's well, well, well outside of it. Again, caught it early. Dealt with it. Not bad, Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? So look, so look, Hank Green's fine. Eli, you're just being dark. You're just being gloomy because you're a doomer. But the interesting part is my uncle, again, not a joke, died. <laughs> died horribly of Hodgkin's lymphoma. That is not a way that you want to die. My uncle, my uncle was a beast of a man. My uncle was an old-fashioned man's man. 
He owned a uh, construction company uh, where they lived out in the Midwest. Uh, smart guy. Uh, actually, when you walked into his house, he died at like 30, 32 or 33. But even by then, when you walked into his house, he had patents on the wall. So he owned a construction company. He had patents on the wall. He had a temper. Oh, my God. He got into an argument uh, with one of his uh, employees on the roof of a house. <laughs> this isn't a joke. <laughs> this isn't a joke. He threw his employee off the roof. <laughs> oh, yeah. When we talk about like, that's why I find adorable nowadays. You know what's so cute? You know what's so cute about the modern social justice movement? It's when they talk about toxic masculinity. They're like microaggressions and all this other horseshit. Motherfucker, one generation before me, the men of my family were chucking fuckers off the roof. Joke. Don't worry, he wasn't arrested. My other uncle was the sheriff. <laughs> oh, sad but true. Anyways, beast of a guy. Beast of a guy. He just got whittled down to nothing. It is just a hell of a thing what cancers can and cannot do. So anyways, I don't know. <laughs> some conversation about cancer. But I find this is kind of interesting. Why I find this to be interesting as I'm sitting here at the Daily Blob. So doing these Daily Blob videos, I'm just talking about the things that I find to be curious. Cancer is not that curious. It is what it is. But I think it's more interesting is this whole idea of what is the psychological implication of Hank Green dying, right? Because there's a very reasonable chance Hank Green is going to die a rather god-awful death. Uh, if, if you watch his videos, and again, I'll actually be mean here, right? Most of us are going to die alone horribly. <laughs> Reality. Anyways, if you look at it, he has this autoimmune condition going on. He's got a lot of other health issues going on. And then to add Hodgkin's on top of that, and then to add chemo on top of it. Because there's this interesting thing about chemo. You know chemo is a poison? Do you know how chemo actually works? You want to know, oh my god, this is how we actually do stuff. Maybe leeches were better. Like here, Here's how chemo actually works. This is so fucked up. Chemo is literally a poison. All right, so when you go through chemotherapy, they literally, literally poison you. The idea being is that the poison is supposed to be, kind of like Roundup, supposed to be targeted towards the cancer. So the idea is that the poison that they're injecting into your body is going to be more toxic to the cancer than it is going to be to the rest of the cells in your body. So the idea being, this is not a joke, it's true. They are going to poison you with the hope, hope that the cancer cells die before the other cells in your body. That's a hell of a thing to go through. Um, <clears throat> and so the interesting thing, one of the curious things with people who go through cancer and they get chemotherapy, is a lot of times they get uh, um, uh, second order health issues after the chemotherapy because they literally poison the shit out of their body uh, to kill the cancer. And again, how, how our medical system works, Again, uh, you know, I talk about 13-year-olds getting bariatric surgery. I know some people out there might get mad at me about this. But again, actually having dealt with the, the medical uh, establishment in the United States, there's a reason I get concerned about this. Because with the, 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 the medical establishment in the United States is very goal-focused. <laughs> they see a goal, they go after it, right? And so that's the thing. You know, if they cure you of cancer and then you die of a heart attack, they won. We saved that patient from a death of cancer. But they stroked the fuck out. Oh, well, that's... I wasn't responsible for them stroking. They didn't die of cancer. Right? Again, if you take a look at it, like, chemo is a bitch. There's, uh, there are these micro-seizures that a lot of folks who have gone through chemotherapy actually get. There's, uh, there's immune issues you can get after chemotherapy. There's these seizures you can get after chemotherapy. I mean, again, shocking. You poison the ever-loving crap out of your body. Uh, there's second-order effects. Um, so anyway, so it's interesting to take a look at. So, so Hank Green, you know, just got diagnosed with cancer. He's got to go through those treatments. It's supposed to be the flu of cancers, but 
again, my own uncle died from this shit, so people die from the flu. Again, that was the interesting thing with COVID. It's so weird with this medical stuff when things come up. Because I remember that, like, like Trump came out. Trump came out and it was like, you know, COVID is, is no more deadly than the flu. Now, to be clear, it was. To be clear, it was. But let's just, let's just go with that for a second. Let's just go with it for a second. COVID is no more deadly than the flu. I was like, oh, oh okay. And just the flu, just the flu. Oh, my Christ. You know the flu kills like fifty to 100,000 Americans every year. But we don't think about it. We don't think, oh, it's just the flu. And then you see the stats. You're like, oh, my God. This kills a lot of people in the United States. Anyways, so let's say he goes. Let's say it goes through, even if that doesn't kill him. Again, he's already got a lot of health issues, whatever else. The chemo going to fuck up his body, a whole bunch of other things. Definitely could die a different way. And they're sitting there, and you're like, God damn, he lies morose. Uh, yes. Did I tell you the time I was mopping up my mom's crap that she died in? I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry your life is so gentled and coddled. You have never had to see what happens to a hardwood floor when your mother's shit literally dries on it after she died in it. Which, which is your loss. It is your loss. It's fucking beautiful. It's fucking beautiful. If hipsters, if hipsters knew what human shit did to hardwood floors, there would be like a renaissance everybody you go to like the little martini bars or whatever be like oh did you poop on your floors like oh i'm gonna drink so much tonight i'm gonna shit all over my bedroom floors it's gonna be beautiful anyways true story um <clears throat> but anyway so there's a good there's a good chance that hank green uh reasonable chance reasonable chance that hank green is gonna die uh within short order not within 80 years within the next couple of years because it's life it's how it goes um, you know, put, put your, put your stuff in order. <laughs> Tell the people that you love them, that you love them. Do the crap that you want to do. Cause we're all going to die. But what I think is interesting about this though, is I think about this whole question of you, you, the viewer that I absolutely do not love. I don't love, and I probably won't, won't like any of you. And let's just say you probably wouldn't like me when you met me. That's fine. That's great, right? Anyways, but there's this interesting thing where the people on the other side of this camera feel as if they have a relationship with the people that they watch. Like we have a virtual version of a friend that I used to have. So there used to be these things called porches back before YouTube, back before social media. You know, we used to go to people's porches and sit on a porch and drink a beer or coffee and talk to each other. It was amazing. It was almost like they were right in front of us. Because they were. Anyways, we had this buddy when I lived in Baltimore City. First place my wife and I owned. And uh, when you'd walk by his house, he'd start talking to you. Then you'd come up to the porch. And then you'd just start talking. And it was interesting. It was, like, there were some people that can just talk. Talk and talk. And they're interesting and they're funny and you can just sit there for hours again it was like it was like a, a real world version of youtube you go by the porch you go up he starts talking at you uh, and then when you gotta go you say oh i gotta go man and then you go all right very little conversation <laughs> very little bag for all oh, towards you right anyways good he was good at what he did um well any interesting things i think about uh, and he died uh wait for it can't say that was even sadder oh that story is so fucking sad oh that was a so anyway i don't even laugh at that that, that was a really sad one because he uh he a uh, great guy i mean again, to be clear absolutely wonderful human being but um his father had died his father had died when he was a kid and so the one thing he promised himself is that he would get in shape and be healthy for his kids you want to know how that story ended? <laughs> not pretty. Not pretty. Uh, I think his oldest was like five or six or something. His youngest was like two when he died. A boy for it. <laughs> Cancer. Because that's how this shit works. Anyways. <clears throat> the interesting thing, though. Like, I think about that. So it was a buddy of mine. And it was hard when he died. I was like, oh, my God. 
so one of the things I think about, like with Hank Green and this modern world, right? Because we really, we really haven't come to terms with this modern world of social media and what it does to us psychologically. And there's a lot of bullying and there's a lot of peer pressure and there's a lot of look it down in this, right? On people that interact in the social media world. And so one of the things that I wonder, like when Hank Green dies, if Hank Green dies, you know, within the next year, year, year to five years, probably at this point, before YouTube dies, YouTube's gotta die. If Hank Green dies after YouTube, nobody will give a shit. But if Hank Green dies before the end of YouTube, one of the things I wonder is how many of his viewers have a very uh, psychologically unhealthy quote unquote relationship with Hank Green, right? They come in, they watch Hank Green, and they feel good. They feel like they have a friend. So Hank and John Green have been doing videos since like 2008. They've been doing videos far longer than I have. Uh, they've been doing videos far more consistently than I have. Uh, they created uh, VidCon, so the big uh, YouTube or whatever the fuck conference it is now. They were the ones that actually create VidCon. They created a lot of other things. They created SciShow. They created a lot of stuff with PBS. They, they are truly an institution on YouTube. And they are definitely the type of institution on YouTube where somebody could have basically essentially grown up with them, right? You know, if you were 14 or 15 uh, back in 2008, you started watching their videos. You know, it's quite reasonable reasonable that you might be, you know, about 30 now as they, as they go into their 40s and you follow them on that progress as I don't know if John has kids. I don't know if Hank has kids. Right, they've gone through the whole thing. And again, in the, this modern world where we have a very psychologically screwed up view of what social media is and this concept that we have these relationships with people on the other side, one of the questions that I ask is what is the psychological ramifications of Hank Green dying? Right. So my wife has cancer. So me saying my wife has cancer, people accept that. People accept that. Oh, that's hard on you. Right. That's no. Right. Wife has cancer. It's hard on the partner. That makes sense because, oh, my God, some days it sucks. Anyways, fine. If I said, oh, it's hard on me because my friend has cancer. So let's say the friend that I had that got that got cured or whatever from Hodgkins, um, let's say it came back, right? And that would be hard. Again, my, my buddy who died, my buddy who died tragically from cancer, right? And that's very understandable that there would be a psychological ramification there. But what becomes interesting is modern social media world is what is the psychological ramification of your fake friend, and I will re-fucking iterate this, your fake fucking friend on the other side of the screen, and I'm sorry to say that, because I'm trying to be polite, trying to be nice, even though I don't. Anyways, what happens when that person that people think is their friend, that thinks is their relation, gets a horrible disease and dies rather badly? And the curious part here is how do we as a society deal with that? Right? If I if I go to work, if I go to work, not that I would go to work, I'm a horrible employee. That's why I'm the boss. <laughs> well, Eli, why do you want to own a company? Because I'm a really garbage employee. Anyway, let's say, right? Anyways, let's say you go to work. You go to work and you're having a really bad day, things aren't working out, and you just can't deal with it, and the boss comes up to you and is like, what's going on, right? You go, look, my good friend just got diagnosed with cancer, and I'm concerned, right? There's generally, depending on your boss, right? Most bosses, right? There's gonna be empathy there, it's going to be there. There's gonna be emotion there. They're going to, well, maybe we can put you on something a little bit less stressful today, or you know what, everything's pretty slow, why don't you go home, right? Your good friend has cancer, you're not dealing with it well. You know what, why don't you go uh, and get your brain around the issue? Here's a question. You have an employee having a bad day or the employee having a bad day. The boss comes up and says, what's going on? <laughs> My favorite YouTube creator has cancer. <laughs> 
<laughs> How do you think that conversation is going to go? <laughs> How many swear words do you believe that boss is either going to say verbally or just think in their brain? And think about that, though. Think about that. Your friend has cancer. Of course, we are going to be supportive of, supportive of you. If your favorite YouTuber has cancer, or one of the YouTubers you follow has cancer, will will society will society not just will society be supportive, but will society denigrate you for having that emotional response? <clears throat> right? You think about things like PTSD or whatever else, other mental health issues. Oh my God, I saw my friend wither before my eyes. People accept that. I saw a YouTuber wither before my eyes. Back to work, God damn it. Right, think about that. Could you, go, could you go to a mental health professional? If you had PTSD from watching Hank Green die a god-awful, horrible death, could you, do you feel that you could go and get mental help for the PTSD from that? Because again, cancer is a bitch. <laughs> cancer is a bitch. Oh, my God. It just, oh, it rips the soul out of you. It's just, wow, like what? And I kind of think this is the, this is kind of like a fascinating thing. Like again, like the morning. What is the morning period of a YouTube creator? And then one of the issues we have in our society, and one of the reasons I talk about this type of stuff, is because we're supposed to be more inclusive, <laughs> right? We're told by a certain type of history that we're supposed to be more inclusive. At the same time, they call everybody else Nazis. <laughs> Damn you, you Nazi! We need to be more inclusive! Maybe stop calling me Nazi. That would be a start. Anyways, right? But again, one of the th one of the th reasons that that I believe in that whole inclusive thing. Again, as I've talked about before, you know, whether whether or not I, whether I disagree with you or whatever on, on political issues, uh, you shouldn't starve to death. Like we're in this weird world. We're in this weird world that if you have a disagreement about whatever, not even going to bring up the subject. Whatever on the subjects, like the other side thinks that you could, should starve to death. And I really just don't see how that's going to make anything better. Because in our society, you actually don't starve to death. We have this weird thing in our society. This is kind of fucked up. Again, from an Aspie standpoint, we're going to go a little Aspie here. <laughs> Trigger warning, we're going Aspie. This is why Aspies will never have a safe space. Because nobody wants to hear this shit. Anyways, like one of the, the, the quote-unquote problems in our society is nobody actually starves to death. Now that might seem horrible. See, <laughs> we want people to starve to death. <laughs> Anyways, right? So the idea is we're going to cancel you, we're going to destroy you, and we're going to crush you, and then you're going to be gone. But the weird thing about our society, that doesn't actually happen. We, we actually have so much material crap. Uh, you, can be, you can be miserable. You can be very, very unhappy with life. Uh, but you're, gen you're generally not going to starve to death in our society. You, you keep being here. Uh, and it's one of the big issues we run into in our society is we keep trying to, you know, genocide folks and they just won't get genocided. Um, and then they, they stick around <laughs> and then you have this whole mass of people that you tried to genocide that actually haven't gone fuck away. Oh, and then, you know, the insanity of modern life ensues. Right. Uh, and so one, that's one of the things that, that I argue is like when you have this whole mass of people that have been disenfranchised and the whole nine yards, like, they don't go. I mean, that's, 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 uh, oh, that, that's homeless. Again, homeless issues, homelessness issues. That's, that's crime issues. That, that's abuse issues. That, that, that's drug usage issues. That's, um, you know, just the streets being freaking dirty for Christ's sakes. All right. And so again, one of the, the, the points that I argue is instead of trying to cancel people, you know, it's, or basically with me is, you know, everybody should be able to afford a house. You should be able to afford a house and you should be able to afford food. You should be, be able to afford basic transportation. My concept is, <clears throat> you know, the, the poor people have posters on their wall. And the rich people have actual art on their wall, uh, but they've still got walls and they've still got roofs, right? The, this whole idea of, um, you know, trying to other the folks. I just don't think it's going to work out well at the end of the day. Uh, and that's where, like, again, with the inclusiveness is one of the things that I wonder with this is when people have major psychological issues because they feel that their friend died horribly in front of their eyes. 
if they do not feel that they can go and get mental health uh, help and they feel that if they talk about this, they're going to be denigrated and ostracized, that means you're going to have a lot of people with true and actual mental health problems that literally do not try to go and get mental health support. And that's just going to be bad, I think, for us all. And so that's where I kind of wonder here, again, this intersection between Hank Green dying, the modern world, mental health, and everything else. Have we thought about how this functions in a modern society? We've thought about relationships and not just relate. Again, like, you know, we've had social media for 12 years. So for most, most of this, it's been a ride. Hey, look, the 18-year-old got the 30, right? That, that's why most uh, young people don't have health insurance because most of them don't need it unless something stupid happens to them, right? We haven't seen a lot of social media influencers die at this point. But as they age, as they age, as they get older, right there, they're going to get the cancers. They're going to get hit by buses, the whole nine yards. And have we, have we set up our systems of empathy, our systems of compassion to deal with, to deal with the effects of that? And how again? If you have again, if you have Hank Green again, think about that. Hank Green, the 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 vlog brothers have like four million, I think four million subscribers, and they've actually got real subscribers, not like mine, not the dead ones. <laughs> My subscribers were so nice; they died before me. <laughs> they were like, "No, Eli, <laughs> Eli, we we can't deal with watching you die online. We'll just get hit by buses before anyway." <clears throat> Inside joke, if you don't know what that means. Um, but the interesting part with them is they've got like 4 million real viewers. They have not just not just hundreds or thousands. They have tens of thousands of people that have connected with them <clears throat> on an emotional level. <clears throat> and what happens to those people when Hank dies? I don't know. Some things to ponder. Some things to ponder. Some things to think about. Because even in the real world, even in the real world, right? Somebody dies. Like somebody you know dies. People will still be like, suck it up. Can you imagine when your YouTuber dies? <laughs> how much sympathy are you going to get for that? And how is it going to fuck with you, right? Because again, I think that's one of the interesting things like with the cancer is like there's this idea that there's a lot of compassion for cancer. There's actually not a lot of compassion for cancer. I mean, there's some compassion for cancer, but there's a lot of, uh, like one of the interesting things that I've noticed is you're supposed to act a certain way, which is really weird for my brain. <laughs> do what you need to do. Okay, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> what? <laughs> Again, like you're not supposed to be morose. And this whole thing, you're gonna, you, nobody gets out of life alive. <laughs> You say that to people. Oh my golly! <sighs> right there's a, there's this there's these weird actions you're supposed to take, and there's these weird things that you're supposed to support. I think about that like with my wife is uh, she hates she hates this idea of fighting cancer, right? Because think about this, and again, it's something to think about like with the language that you use and the real effects of your language. Again, we talk about things like microaggression real lived experience, right? This whole idea that you fought cancer is so effed up, right? Because there's this idea, right? You get cancer, you quote unquote fight cancer and you beat cancer, right? Think about that, beating cancer. Do you realize how disgusting those words are? When you say that somebody beat cancer, do you understand how truly and utterly vile of a creature that you're being? What do you mean trying to be supportive? Think about this. Cancer is just cancer. <laughs> cancer is like trying to beat a damn tsunami, right? If you're in the right place at the right time and do the right things at exactly the right positions, maybe you'll survive the tsunami. You could have freaking Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime at the wrong place during a, doing a tsunami. There's not a damn thing he's going to do. He's going to turn into mush, right? Same thing is true with cancer. When do they catch your cancer? 
What is your particular cancer? What are the treatments that you go through? What are the health conditions? What age are you at the time? There's a whole bunch of stuff, again, even going through chemo, right? Giving a 20-year-old chemo is vastly different than giving a 60- or 70-year-old chemo. Does that mean that 20-year-old fought harder to live? No, it just means a damn 20-year-old was 20 years old when it got chemo. That's just it, right? And so again, like when things like with language, it's very weird. Is this whole this whole idea that you beat cancer, right? The insidiousness of that statement is that the people that didn't beat cancer were too weak. The insidiousness of that statement is that the people that didn't quote unquote beat cancer didn't believe enough or didn't have faith or didn't do the right things or weren't strong enough or X, Y, or Z. Right? When you say you beat cancer, there is a mental image to that. But the other side of that mental image is that the people that die horribly from cancer, somehow, somehow they weren't up to snuff. Right, and it's interesting when you look at this, is that there's all of the, these, this language and all of this, like weird sexualization, again, like with breast cancer. So my wife had breast cancer. Uh, she had a double mastectomy, right? But again, even with the pink, uh, the, the pink ribbons, save the tatas. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't get saved, jackasses. <laughs> Where, where do you save them? Do you, do you save them in Tupperware? Hey, uh, yeah, so uh, so when uh, when you're when you're going to core that breast, doctor, you're just going to go in there and you're going to core that breast. Yeah, are you going to give that to us? Uh, is that going to come in Tupperware? Uh, do you have some kind of like a vacuum seal? Do we put it in the freezer? Uh, and we when you give us that tata, save the tata. So when you give us that tata and it's in a Tupperware, so uh, so so what is it like? Every year on the anniversary, we both like take a bite of the tata. <laughs> Do you fry the tata? Do you flay the tata? <laughs> I mean, we're saving the tatas, right? No, motherfuckers, you don't save the tatas, you dumbass pieces of shit, jackasses. They go away. And again, the interesting thing, so my wife just had um, mastectomy of mastectomies. Anyway, so, so again, 12 years, ago, 12 years ago, my wife had a double mastectomy. <coughs> and she never felt great after it. Uh, it's kind of interesting. There's something actually called, uh, was it breast implant syndrome? Have you heard of that? Yeah, it's, you know, there's a syndrome from breast implants. You know, it exists. Don't talk about that. Anyways, <clears throat> she never she never felt right with them. In. Like from day one, she never felt right. She had them in for 12 years. Didn't feel right. Uh, so the uh, every 10 years, you have to swap them out like tires. Only with a lot longer bed rest. Anyways, uh, so she just decided to be done with it. Um, and they're gone. And But the interesting part, again, the interesting part, is people have asked her, it's like, oh, what's it like to lose your breasts, right? Because she just had it, she had done, the, we're, we're still in the recovery period right now. And uh, she looks at people and goes, yeah, I'm fine. I lost my breast 12 years ago. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. Again, you don't think, you don't think about things that way. And she's thought about it a lot. As far as she's concerned, she lost her breast 12 years ago. Whatever the fuck those things were, they weren't breasts. Uh, <laughs> Eli, what? Eli, your lived experience is going against the narrative. You need to shut up now. But yeah, it's interesting. You see all that. Save the tatas. And then again, too. I say if you're a breast cancer, quote unquote, survivor, and they're saving the tatas. Again, like again, like again, you think about that, the healing process and all that. So there's there's some there's some doctors that refuse to do the double mastectomy unless the woman gets reconstructive surgery. Even though there is breast implant syndrome, this is an actual thing. Even though breast implants, uh, you have to replace them every 10 years. Uh, it's actually a pretty significant surgery. My wife got it. We didn't think it was going to be that significant. Again, we were literally, it was, the joke was, it was like replacing uh, tires. They were like, oh, what we're going to do is we're just going to cut here and here. We'll pull the old ones out. We'll shove the new ones in. Right? You're like, oh, that's not bad. 
It's amazing. It's amazing with doctors. They tell you something a decade ago, and then when it comes up the time to actually do what you're supposed to do, you realize, what, what do you mean six weeks of recovery? I thought it was like tires. Anyways, right? But there's this whole, there's this whole push. There's this whole push for reconstructive surgery. And again, you think about with the breast cancer, you know, those, pink, you know, those pink ribbons and save the tatas. If you survive breast cancer, again, how does that psychologically skew the decision that you're going to make? If you're not going to have breasts, again, maybe just not have breasts. I think I'll remove them anyway. I mean, they get removed. Things get put in. Stuff gets put over it. That's not a breast. It's a weird ass. I don't know. It's a man-made blister, I suppose. And so, again, one of the things to be thinking about is, so if a woman is going through all of this, looking the double mastectomy, and you have the, you have the, this insidiousness, you know, save the tatas, that's always going on the back of the mind, how much does that skew the woman to decide to get breast reconstructive surgery, even if it truly may not be a very good solution for her? Right? I don't know. Things to ponder about with language and all that kind of stuff. But never tell somebody they beat cancer. Never tell somebody you beat cancer. Right? Yeah, because you were strong. That's why, I hate. I always be oh, well, you were strong. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. Because basically what you're saying is all those people that died from cancer, they were somehow inferior. And if that isn't a kick in the crotch, I don't know what is. So there you go. Some thoughts. Some thoughts, some pondering today on cancer and Hank Green and what happens when the people that are not your fucking friends die. What is the psychological ramification of that? What is the psychological ramification of that at scale? Do people have empathy for that type of thing? And some things to ponder, some things to ponder and some things to think about. <laughs> oh, golly. Man, I wish I had the life of most of these SJW. <laughs> I see so many SJWs out there. They're like, they're like so fist, pissed over like microaggressions. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, I wish I had the brain power <clears throat> for microaggressions. <laughs> But anywho, anywho, put your thoughts, put your thoughts down below. What are your thoughts about Hank Green? What are your thoughts about cancer? What are your thoughts about the language around cancer? And again, like how, and how we use language in ways, again, you try to pump up some people, but by pumping up some people, again, it just inherently denigrates others. Do you think about that? Anyways, <clears throat> I need to stop procrastinating. <clears throat> I have a uh, I have a Linux class. I have a Linux class I need to teach tomorrow. So we're doing a uh, Silicon Dojo, authorityless, gatekeepless, free to the end user, hands-on technology education that empowers you to do whatever the hell it is that you want to do. Uh, we're doing our intro to Linux class tomorrow. It'll be a two to three hour class. They'll install Linux. They'll play with permissions. They'll do all that kind of stuff. And I've still got to write it. I still have to write the class. Uh, this is called procrastination. It's kind of funny. Like you look at you look at students. You look at students. And you're like students. You need to stop procrastinating. And then you go home and you look at your pile of work. And you're like, oh, you know what I really need to do right now? Play some more Zelda. Oh, I love Zelda. I love Zelda. Have you been playing Zelda? Tears of the Mountain, or whatever the hell it's called. That is a great, that is a great little game. I've been playing the hell out of Zelda. Been playing so much Zelda. <clears throat> I have not finished the Linux class. And now I'm babbling into a camera so I don't have to finish the Linux class. So feel better, feel better. We're all the same. Students, teachers, we all procrastinate. The main thing with me is I can't wait. Once all this is done, once I have all my classes done, then I don't have to worry about this crap anymore. But anywho, anywho.
That's all I got. So put your thoughts, put your thoughts down below. Again, if you wanna, if you want some in-person education, um, Silicon Dojo, we have in-person education. We do, uh, we're doing a Linux class this week. So tomorrow, actually, Linux class this week, or for you probably today. I don't know, whatever. Uh, we're doing an introduction to programming the week after. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna have uh, Jacob Haug. Haug, that's how you say his name. Mm -hmm. Forcing geeks to learn how to say people's names. Anyways, Jacob Haug is going to, he's CEO of Level IO. So we're going to be having a uh, fireside chat with him. That should be fun in a couple of weeks. And we're just going to keep on going. That's right. I'm here every day. I'm here every day trying to ship in person education. Anyways, I'm still procrastinating. I am still procrastinating. All right, go. See y'all later.